morning, everyone, and welcome to our roundtable. This morning is Sunday, October 2nd, 2016. Our subject, Unreality, Golden Text Ruth. Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day. I'm going to begin today. Um, Florence wanted to speak a little bit about the forum highlights, so go ahead, Florence. I just want to mention that it's having good reception from those that are reading it, and uh, I find myself I'd like to keep them. So uh, the thought came, though, to um, have them in quarterly sections if Jeremy is willing to uh, put them in print, you know, in print the way they send them out, but in sections because we have so many in three monthly sections. And if people are interested in it, they could buy it for gifts for Christmas. I am, and it, it's something that I thought others might be interested in, because I do get quite a bit of feedback as to how much the content helps the practical practice of Christian science. So if anyone is interested, they could email me or email Jeremy, and we'll have an idea of you know, what extent the interest is. As far as pricing, it could be just, you know, for the mailing of it. Um, that's what has come so far, so let us know. Thank you very much. Yeah, good idea. A bound volume of forum highlights. Yeah, and it wouldn't, it was just for the mailing or, you know, our, our immediate expenses. It wouldn't be very much. It'd be something you could include with a calendar or, um, or not, but anyway, it would make a nice Christmas gift. And the great thing now that we have this digital printer is we can print uh, according to who wants to. We used to have to print in large quantities, or but now if you know we get ten orders, we'll we'll print ten. So do let us know. Uh, last week we spoke about. Um, some, some things concerning witchcraft and Satanism, and Jeremy, after after the class, he looked up um, called the nine Satanic statements originally appearing in the Satanic Bible. Um, I'm going to have someone read them all, and then we're just going to take the first one. I've often had people ask about how to do a watch, and at one time we did watching workshops, and uh, we haven't done those. So this is going to just be an opportunity. We're going to take a statement from the Sat Satanic Bible and do a watch on it, how you would how you would handle the belief. And um, I will have Jeremy, you read all nine of them. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see, the first one is, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Number two, Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Three, Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Four, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Five. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Six. Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Seven. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who, because of, quote, his divine spiritual and intellectual development, unquote, has become the most vicious animal of all. And eight, Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. And then nine, Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. <laughs> so, 
the reason we're discussing this is it, these are it's it's mortal mind, um, and it's out there, and it needs to be dealt with. So. Uh, a few of you have seen this before the class, and, and perhaps Jeremy might put the list up on, the, on our watch section so people can see it and be handling it as in personal animal magnetism. But I would just like some thoughts about how you would do a watch on that or handle the first one and read the first one again, Jeremy. Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Okay, well, since I had a little time, <laughs> um, I, I I started by just, you know, looking up indulgence and then abstinence. And indulgence is, is, in 1828 Webster's, is free permission to the appetite, humor, desires, passion, or will to act or operate. And the, you know, there's more to it, but um, it's basically doing whatever you would like. And then abstinence was refraining from or forbearing any action. And so when I when I read that, I thought since it says Satan represents, that means that he's these things are like the image and likeness of him. You know, the, the indulgence, indulging in the the works of the flesh and. So I, I, a lot of times I go back to that Galatians 5, 19 to 21, where it talks about all the different things, the adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, all the things that represent the works of the flesh, and then uh, then how it goes into the fruits of the spirit. The spirit. So that, that always helps me to know how to turn that around. So. Anyone else? Now, the way this thing is stated, indulgence instead of ab abstinence, it's almost put forth as if indulgence were more appealing or desirable. Exactly. The only desire and satisfaction is following God. My study said somewhere, a feast of soul and a famine of sin. To starve out this personal selfish inclination. It never satisfies. It always ends in destruction. I think if we're the most intelligent animal on the face of the earth, we might learn this sometime and follow that which is good, because it's really the only way. Thank you. Thank you both. And it really all gets back to the belief that my life, my intelligence, and my substance is material, right? So I need to pander to the material senses need to indulge what the material senses tell me they want, which is really just mortal mind, all of which has nothing to do with God and has nothing to do with life or happiness. Yeah. God yeah, is I, all. Go ahead. Thank you. God is all spirit. Therefore, there is not, nothing else. And then I would go into what this indul indulgence claims to be and know that it is not. Thank you. Yeah, it claims to be a source of satisfaction when it can't be. It's impossible to satisfy. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. Who's going to speak? I, I wanted to ask, ask a question. Wasn't there um, something that Mrs. Evans gave us at one time? Uh, my mind cannot drift into evil, or something like that. That's from um, yeah. that's from Mrs. Eddy. Yes, it's in prose work. Right, but she but she had you know given it to us in a class once to use, and I thought it was very good, but I can't remember the exact. What was the phrase? I don't I know the exact. Well, I thought it's mine. I think you told me. Sharon, not Sharon not knows it. My mind is to find good and cannot drift into evil. Okay, that would be maybe a good one to use for a watch on that subject. Hello, I have um. Stayed on God. Who's speaking? Sorry, it was Charlie. 
I've, I've been working with this since Jeremy um, gave us the list. And I start like many of you do, and then don't be afraid. Christians abstain from indulgence of any sort. We restrain ourselves from decadence, excess, and self-glory. Spirit cannot indulge in sense, and we are spirit. Did you write that yourself, or is that a quote? I wrote that. Okay, good. From everything I read. Good, thank you. Think about it. Think about it for yourself, because what Bruce said is true. All of these arguments are trying to get you to think that I mean, abstinence sounds sort of horrible, you know, you know abstaining from something. You're kind of forcing yourself not to do something you really want to do. <laughs> so, but think about it. Think about when you've indulged yourself. What has happened? Give an example. Well, food, and then you're uncomfortable. Yes, yeah, great. All you can eat. All you can oh, eat. So indulge load in up. It. <laughs> you wake up the next morning and think, what did I do? <laughs> well, yes. Anybody else indulging in something? It's well, maybe say on something that you really want, um, you know, and then you buy it and it just doesn't do anything for you. Yes. I think it's really a false sense of incompleteness. I, I'm lacking something. There's something else to fulfill me, make me complete out there. Absolutely, yes, and you're seeking it in the wrong way. But it always ends. I mean, you can indulge yourself in the, you indulge yourself in hateful thoughts. Oh, gosh, I have a reason to hate that person. He, that was just so mean to me, and I'm just going to sit and think about it for a while. <laughs> or a pity party. Awesome. I'm, I'm miserable. I have every reason to be miserable. Boo hoo hoo hoo. You indulge. And what, what is the other end of that? What's the end when you do that? Do you feel better? No, you feel terrible. <laughs> you feel a lot worse. Indulgence is not what it claims to be. It's not good. You won't like it. So. And what about you know, the local bridge club? Spend an afternoon playing bridge and gossiping. Okay. <laughs> Sunday gossip. morning to coffee with everyone. Right. It's all over the place now. I mean. Yeah, and what does that accomplish? Makes the error more real, brings more depression. It's a false sense of pleasure, really. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not just the the uh, the afternoon teas and the clubs. I mean, you know, how many church foyers are filled with gossip? I think Mrs. E Mrs. Evans absolutely forbade. She annihilated it <laughs> <laughs> in this church. Well, I know. I told my daughter when she was getting a job that you got to watch out for the people that gather around and. and talk badly about other people because in 15 years they're still going to be there doing it and you don't want to be there with them. You've got to keep going. So. Thank you. Yeah. Usually any after any indulgence you feel really awful. Okay? It might, it might try to lure you into it but you're going to feel really terrible. So a watch to handle it and, and this was the way Mrs. Evans gave us this watch, and I, I think it's a wonderful way to impersonalize it by starting. First, as Florence did, you start with the allness of God. Um, always you start with the allness of God. All is spirit. There is no other attraction. There is no, no other law, cause, uh, and substance. It's the only, the one and only God omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. Then she would say, animal magnetism calling itself. Animal magnetism calling itself indulgence. And then, and then you annihilate it. And you annihilate it by stripping it of its power, by knowing it has no power, because God is all power. 
to me, all I have to do is have a flash of how I feel after I've indulged, and I don't, you know, that's, I don't want to go there. But if you're if you're tempted in that way, or we're handling it worldwide, well, no, it, it has no attraction, it has it has no law, cause, substance, it has no foundation because it is not of God. And then, after annihilating the belief of it, then what do you do? It cannot be reversed. That this treatment cannot be reversed. No, before that, you you replace it with what is true. Yes. You you end end again with the all power of God, the only attraction. He's all he gives. He's what gives you um, satisfaction, contentment, joy. Nothing else does. And, you know, the Bible talks about all things in moderation, right? And that, that's a good good little piece of advice from the Bible. <laughs> so, and, and you work on it in that way, and then you end it with what Fairley said, that this treatment cannot be reversed. But in your, in your heart, in your mind, it has no further power over you. The suggestion of indulgence has no power over you, and you know it has no power over anyone anywhere. This is this is what a watch comp is comprised of, and it's powerful. And this is what your watches should be. And as we've talked about, what we give you on our Unity watches three times a week is is a springboard, um, some ideas, some suggestions. But then you take it and make it yours, and you work with it. Now, I've had someone who every few weeks calls me and tells me that they don't feel worthy. So what does that show? Identifying yourself correctly. Right. It also, also shows they've been listening to that voice that's being fed to her, and she's not putting up her defenses. They haven't annihilated the suggestion. You get the suggestion, you feel unworthy, what do you do with it? Is it true? No, God didn't say it. Thank you. How could God's image God. and likeness ever be unworthy? It, so, so if you're thinking that, truth you're malpracticing against God. <laughs> yes, you are. It goes back to what Janet said yesterday. Your love for God has to be so, so much greater than your love for yourself. You're just, it's total selfish to be thinking that. You are, you are, it's almost like blasphemy because you are God's image, so you're saying God's image isn't worthy. You, you strip it of any power at all, and then that thought will not come back to you it, because there'll be no entrance. It can't reach you anymore. The door is slammed on it. Shut. You're not listening. Not listening. Okay? That's why that thought is not humility. Think of yourself as unworthy, is not being humble. It's one of the worst forms of pride. It's wicked. Because it's a lie about God's creation. It's a lie it's, about God. It's an offense to God to think that of yourself. Mrs. Eddy has, I don't know where it's from, where she says to claim your infinite, harmonious, Christ-expressing selfhood, your beauty, your moral beauty, and then she mentions the words worth and value. And I find claiming that for myself every day is very helpful, knowing my worth and my value. Thank you. You're all of great worth to God, every one of you. Goodness, the fact that you're here, the fact that you want to learn more of God, he's got something wonderful for your life. And if Era tells you you're not worthy, you need to kick it the you-know-what out once and for all and annihilated. And that suggestion, if it, should, if it comes again, you should be so fast to getting rid of it, to keep indulging in it, because that's the indulgence. 
You're doing it willfully once you know better. And that is indulgence. That's Satan's statement. I, 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 this morning I decided we're just going to strip this all bare so it has, can have no so-called influence on any of God's children, which you all are. And that's just one suggestion. I know you all probably have a whole list of suggestions you can get or you think you hear. And it's not a matter that you get them because even Jesus was tempted with thoughts. It's what you do with what comes. And if it keeps coming, you keep hitting it back. But eventually, guess where it, that door should be so slammed shut, it, it knows it can't get to you. You're saying it's actually a sin to do that. It is a sin. Yes. And why is it a sin? To dishonor God, for goodness sake. I mean, you're saying God is something that you're not. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, when, when I... not make <laughs> it's declaring that there is a power other than God that is you or has got you. And then you are truly, you're believing in, in Satan's principles. I won't call them principles, Satan's statements. You've no. gone to the dark side. The other thing that goes along with this, we all have thoughts come to us. It does happen. But then if we feel bad, ashamed, or guilty because it's come, that is another sin. Because the appropriate response is to rise. Rise in moral character that refuses it, knocks it out. We talked about killing the enemy yesterday. The enemy is the wrong thoughts. They're not other people. Therefore, there's nothing personal about this, so you shouldn't have any qualms about killing it. Killing this enemy. There you go. That's it. Have a the sword in one hand and a tool in the other. You keep that sword raised. We have to. We have to be fighters for Christ. Now, um, the enemy, these thoughts don't come to you with a sword in their hand. How do they come to you? They come like your own thoughts. Tailor-made. Yeah, Tailor-made, yes. Yeah, yep. they, they come dressed up like something really attractive. I want to entice you. It's a malicious mind. Right, right. Like the, the, the apple on the apple tree. Look good for food. Tasty. That's how the that's how these thoughts are gonna to come to you. Bruce? I'm here. Oh hi, and everybody. It's Betty. I wanted to just observe that much of advertising or for products is based on, on this idea or, or notion of being indulgent. And uh, it's evident at the grocery store newsstand counter and so forth, which, which um, you know, I, I, I try to avoid, but I can tell there's some sort of attractive tendency in that, which is just something that is animal magnetism or something that the people who create that stuff, you know, are playing with to try to get people to att be attracted to it. But um, just just observing that a lot of advertising is based on indulgence. Thank you. Well, that's absolutely right. You're never yeah. satisfied. You need more and more. You need the bigger car. You need more clothes. You need this new gadget for your kitchen. You need it, you need it, you need it, and you don't indulge in it. And I guess it was Elizabeth who said you get it, and you don't feel so great still. And you see and the tremendous excess in these huge, 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 huge homes that are being built. I mean, can you imagine just cleaning one of those places? I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. But uh, well, you're right. It's all over. We see it everywhere. Everywhere. Something that you'll believe. If it came to you in a, your hair's pink and it's really brown, you wouldn't believe it. So it has to come in a way you'll believe it. Right, and it, it takes you when you're off guard, not working for God, when you're a little bit dreamy, when, you know, you're just kind of floating around and those, those 
thoughts are, are flying around there, but Mrs. Eddy says if truth and virtue build a strong defense, they can't go around like wandering pollen. That's a paraphrase of science and health. You have to have the virtue and truth there, and you'll know, know it, and you'll cast it out. So all of this is intertwined in uh, doing a good watch. And also, this person who keeps bringing up how unworthy she is, she's a very loving person, OK? Not that she's not loving. But until you annihilate those suggestions, you can just try to be so nice and loving and nice and loving and nice and loving, and you still get the suggestions. You've got to get rid of them. If you are like the Christ who can just be it and love it, or like Mrs. Eddy and, and can have that tremendous pouring of love that annihilates error everywhere, and as you grow, you get more and more that way, um, well, that's great. That's, that's, that's the standpoint in which we all should be. But most of us need some arguing, and we need to annihilate the suggestion. In the meantime, for most of us, there's still work. There's work. And sometimes a lot of work to be done. And when you do that and you annihilate, you shut the door to the era, then it makes a pathway for the light to come shining through. And the divine love, not the human love that never satisfies you or anybody else, but the divine love that does satisfy and heal. Any questions on this before we go into science and health? I want to uh, just say that I really appreciate you doing this once again because Mrs. Eddy said, I believe, it's repeating and defeating, repeating and defeating. And uh, it's taken me during this 40 times to start to make progress on it. But I am so happy to say that uh, just thinking about this the other day, looking back where I was one year ago, where I am today, not perfect, but uh, those days I would go the whole day now practicing on everything in sight. Day, at least I'm starting to catch it earlier and uh, defeating it. And uh, so I guess I, I'm saying I totally appreciate you doing this one more time because I know I need it. Thank you, Mike. And it is why we do it. Because some, some people have been here a long time and still have a difficulty with it. It is repeating and defeating and repeating and defeating. And Lord knows all our training was repeating and defeating over years. So much patience with everyone else because it, it, it does require, like anything else, practice. You've got to do it. You can't think about doing it. You can't read about doing it. You have got to do it. And also, your practitioner can't do it for you. You can pray and help, but you, I used to wish, Mrs. Evans, couldn't you please stop these thoughts from coming into my head? <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? You couldn't. You, you are your thinking, so yes, you are. I had to do it. I just wanted to make a comment about worth. When you do constantly hold steadfastly to the truth that Mrs. Eddy tells us to do, then you see the worth which is unfolded to you, which you always had. It never was not. It always was and will be. And it's just the false suggestion that you're not worthy that keeps that un unfoldment from coming through. So like you said, once you defeat it, you see it. But it's not something that you make. It's something you've always had. Exactly right. Thank you. No, that's the a truth wonderful, about you, yes. Great point. Because with God, with God, all things are possible. Without God, you aren't worth two cents. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can't do this. This is not a human thing. It's not a human. It's not a human thing. It, it isn't. Rising in the strength of spirit. It is. It is God working in your life. Because truly, as a human being, you're right. You'll never be worthy. <laughs> We're all just, you know, not worth much. But as God's child, we are worth everything. And when you get those thoughts too. It doesn't just come. Usually it's because you've drifted off in some other thoughts. You've been indulging in some a lot of negativity or error, and it accumulates. So be so instant in truth. Error is always too late, as Mrs. Eddy says. Catch it when it's little. Shut the door 
before it's got you, you know, lying in bed crying your eyes out. I think that's why I, one of the earlier workers stated that Mr. Sedi wanted more than ever that people always throughout the day maintain that thought about God is my mind. And that is a protection, really. It helps you to see quickly what's trying to invade your thought. Thank God you. is my mind to see it as often as possible throughout the day. I know it's helped me. Yes. That's why we start our day with it, and you, it, it, it does. It closes the door on it. You get more sensitive to the wrong thoughts. Because for a while, I mean, I know with me, all these wrong thoughts was just part of what I was. I was just so used to thinking them. I didn't think they were wrong thoughts. But as you grow, you begin to be aware of it. And as you grow, it's declaring your mind. But quote that again from, my mind is divine good and cannot drift into evil. Thank you. That's Mrs. Eddy. What else? Was, Thank you, Mike. I was reminded of an advertisement, because you're worth it, therefore, you know, indulge yourself in this or oh. that thing. <laughs> Right, well, that's the human sense of it. Yeah, exactly. But to some degree, I mean, you have to have a standard for yourself, knowing who and what you are. I mean, there is some truth to that. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a standard with God, so. And the spiritual reality of that thought is, because you are worth it, indulge yourself in the truth. Because the truth is readily available, and the truth heals. And the truth gives you everything you could ever need or want. Ever need. That's right. Think about it. Instead of indulging yourself in some pity party, just start indulging yourself in the truth. Just let all the truth pour into you. And if you're finding it hard, that's when you turn on your computer and listen to readings or hymns or something that just will feed you until you can get your own strength going. But fill your mind with the, the enduring, the good, and the true. And you will bring these into your experience proportionably to what? Yeah, yeah. Of your thought. Yes, yes, yes. You can't fudge that. You cannot get around it. You can't say you want to do it and not, <laughs> not be obedient to God, to your Father. You will suffer until you, you stop the disobedience. And God isn't doing it to you. You are doing it to yourself. Even God if loves you, you. Even if you take whatever you're doing and from a standpoint of glorifying God, it takes it out of the human realm because there's many things like giving people presents which uh, on the surface look good. That's just an example. If you do it from the angle of glorification of God, then it takes it out of the human realm into the divine realm. Thank you. Absolutely right. The human sense of all this won't work. It's got to be God. Getting yourself out of the way, letting God work. Okay, Gary, read number one in Science and Health. Nothing is lost and all is won by a right estimate of what is real. Wow. Come in. Well, nothing can change what's real. <laughs> so it cannot be lost. It might appear to be lost because of our own thinking, but it's never lost. Real is spiritual fact unchanging. Yes. Yes. And the more I learn of what is real, the more I have. The only thing I need to change is my concept of what is real. The right estimate of it. Because our God is an abundant God, He's not a stingy God. So what is the right estimate of your health? It's only health. There is no sickness. 
and real truth. Because God is all. Thank you. God health is it's normal and natural and belongs to each and every one of us. It's not just some dream in the sky somewhere. So practice down to earth. It's the way we are, healthy, as his child. It exists in mind, not in matter. And in that mind, there's no fluctuation. And every part about you, every part of your body, your organs, your, your faculties, all those exist in mind. And they're perfect in mind. That's the real estimate. False estimate is that we have these lumpy human bodies that give us trouble. When you have the right estimate of your health, it can't fluctuate. It's real. It's about the, what is the right estimate of your supply? Infinite. Abundant. Infinite resources. Yes. Who else is that? Fairly? I said infinite. 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 Yeah. It is infinite supply. God is all supply. Abundant. God supplies all our needs. Always. For, for me, once in a while, I get this feeling like, I don't know, it just comes out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, no. And then I just think, well, you know, right now, at this moment, I have everything I need. There's food in the fridge. My computer works. You know, the car is good. It has gas in it. So, and then I realize it's so foolish that I even started worrying about it. So it yeah, helped a lot. So true. And, uh, give us today our daily bread on the Lord's Prayer. That's why we say it every day. This is the truth. Have what you need right now, and you always will. But supply is, is God. And you might see it coming as your job or... Uh, someone else's salary or whatever, but it is, you must put it back to God. That's why Jesus said, think not for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall put on. Yes, but what? What's I don't mean? know if you have need of all these things. Yes, and then? And therefore? And therefore. First. Say it loudly, Bruce. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all things else shall be added unto you. And his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. That is what we do. And if we do that, God gives us our supply. But we have to forget all the worry. And, and as, as Jeremy said, oh, what about tomorrow? What about today? Because when you're worrying about tomorrow, you're, you're missing opportunities that are coming to you right now. You're also, you're, that negative thinking is shutting out God. And, you know, we have these wonderful articles on supply. Martha Wilcox, Bicknell Young, finance, supply, all of those. And how did, how did Jesus demonstrate the loaves and the fishes? That's the God we have. But do we even expect that? We were talking about indulgence earlier. The answer was to indulge in truth. You know what the nice thing about truth is? It never runs out. So please indulge in as much as you want. That's, that's the buffet table where you take all you can have. But the thing is, it opens up the door for the great source of all supply that there is. And he's the one who regulates by what forms and channels it comes to you, not us. So how nice it is to trust in truth and allow it to work in its own way. Yeah, I love the word inexhaustible with supply. It, it really helped me <laughs> when that false sense was <laughs> about to kill me. <laughs> inexhaustible supply, that's it. Well, and that's really important because if you ever, if anybody's ever taken an economics course, one of the basic premises of economics is that there is a limited supply of everything. Supply and demand, right? So therefore, that's 
That's how prices are determined. And it also, the premise is there's a limited supply. Well, that's the wrong premise. It's not the right estimate. And yet, that is how most of mankind thinks. Is it, it, they're thinking their supply is in matter. Exactly. And then... Could I? Um, there. Yeah. Exactly. And Mrs. E Mrs. Eddy, Jesus, many of the prophets, Mrs. Eddy have blown that belief away. Could I make a comment about that, Eddie? Here, about the okay. origin of that economic thing or belief. It came about during the potato famine and Adam Smith. In Ireland, and he wrote the book that he wrote. I guess it was The Wealth of Nations. I've not read it, but that's where he derived the notion that supply is limited, and it caught hold, and it, it sort of multiplied. But there are other economic views coming to the fore now, which are less limiting and. And so we can watch for those. I heard someone recently talk about, you know, and this is in human terms, but about the infinite supply we have of our natural resources. Uh, it, it is. I mean, who, who tells you there's not enough? Usually people that want you to pay a lot of money for what they have to give. But there's all of these things. I mean, America, we've got a huge amount of natural resources, as, certainly as much as we need. Now, again, the indulgence or, or wanting more than what is needed or being wasteful, now those are all sinful qualities. That's why we shouldn't waste and also not being grateful for what we have. We take care of what we have. We're grateful for it. You don't waste it. Those are laws and principles of the universe, but God supplies our need abundantly. And yes, he is the source of all and it's inexhaustible. Someone once explained it to me like a river that flows. God is the river flowing the supply to you. And then you take the supply, you use what you need of it. But then the requirement here, and this is another law of the universe, is to give back. You have to give it back. Otherwise, the, what happens to the river? Pardon me? Right. Um, yeah. You, it's... You block it from flowing. Block it from, from flowing to you. It'll stop. It'll dry up. That him make channels for the Thank you. streams of love. Yes. yes. Beautiful. Or it will always flow or something. Yes. Channels, streams. Think of it as a river flowing. So when you take the good from God and you just take it and sit on it and don't share it or give it to others, you're going to stop the flow. It's, it's like hiding your light under a bushel, right? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. But it, behind that is the belief that there is a limited amount of supply and you need to hoard it for yourself. Hoard it. Keep it. It's about taking and giving. Take it, give it back, and share it. You don't. That's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's our inspiration. Yeah, what is it? The hand that's open to, to receive. Yeah, receive or give. Yeah. It, give, yeah. Give. It's it's open open. To give. It's open to receive. And this is why in our church, it's not a demand, but the idea of tithing, all of these things, it's... it's it's, uh, it's for your own benefit. Yeah, it's, it's laws and rules of the universe. If you think you don't have enough, guess what? You won't. You won't. <laughs> you won't. And if you hoard it and don't want to give it and store it up and or it selfishly, well, the, the river's going to stop. Right? And the real estimate of, of all things. Okay, what is the right estimate of family? belong to God. Everyone belongs to God. The family of man. Thank you. We are all one family because we all have the same father. 
We're also here to help each other cooperate and work together for the common good, uh, driven by selfish wants. All of you here, you are part of this family of God. We are all brothers and sisters. Frankly, you won't ever have any better friends. Why? Because we're working for a common good, a common cause, and we love each other. And then we extend that to love all mankind. But the idea of your personal family, I mean, that that's okay. You, we all have our, I guess, because some, most of us have somewhat of a human family. Some of us don't. Some of us do. But um, and, and we respect and love those that are in this human family. But it's really the, the family of, of God. You all answered that very well, very quickly, as you're learning that lesson. Most of my so-called human family, you know, they, they're not even here anymore. So, uh, okay, I got all you. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Oh, we are. We're the family of God, and we all love each other, and uh, and we extend that love to include and embrace all mankind, because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, because as we said, what is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. Yes. It doesn't say my Father. Our Father. We're all related in that. It's just a wonderful, freeing liberating sense of family. Okay, Gary, read the second one. It is impossible that man should lose aught that is real when God is all and eternally his. The notion that mind is in matter and that the so-called pleasures and pains, the birth, sin, sickness, and death of matter are real is a mortal belief, and this belief is all that will ever be lost. You know, it's a wonderful thing, uh, and that we were taught it many times, that all that you can ever lose is the belief of sin, disease, and death. Isn't that great? Great deal. Great, great deal. You can't lose anything that's real. But sin, and all that is real death, is good. All we have to do is a little work, and then we get a great deal. Great deal. It is a great deal. I understand. Yes, it's a great deal. <laughs> God gives us a great deal on that one. Oh, right. Yes. So, and and we can think about that and know that's all that can be lost is your your wrong sense of it. It's just why we were talking about the real sense, the reality of things. You can just only lose your false sense of it. And what would be a false sense? Yeah. That, and that that fear of loss is a personal sense that wants to claim and keep and hold. There you go. You never lose when, when you make the deal with God. You never do. Because God is love. God always has and always will supply every human need. Yes, he will. That's a promise. And if you keep the first commandment, how can you lose? You can't lose. You know, the story of Job, which we've talked about, he seemed to have lost everything. But then what happened? And another family. And uh, everything that he had lost, and it was just came back to him. It came back to him. Yeah, he never lost his love for God. He never badmouthed God, even though his wife told him to. He clung to the one thing that he knew was real. God. And what he lost was his, as Jeff said, his, his personal sense of the whole thing, thinking they were his and he owned them, and if he lost them, it would be terrible. He got rid of all that personal sense, and everything was restored to him abundantly. You know, yesterday's um, calendar statement was from Herbert Eustace. Never give up anything. Give up only the false sense about it. If you give up the false sense of it, you'll find the true sense there, untouched, radiant, beautiful, 
and in spirit. And it'll be better than you ever thought it was. Yes, it will be better than you ever thought of it. And, and as, as you grow in this science, you're going to prove these things for yourself. And you're going to have more and more faith in this God that loves us. So I will end today with the um, Kimball teaching and address, no, lectures and articles, page 250. There is no law against you. If you mourn, if you have been cast down because of disease, know this. There positively is no law against you. And moreover, know this still further, that you are entitled to enforce the law of your own life. You are entitled to enforce the law of your own health, of your own prosperity. You can do it. You can learn to do it. It is within the confines, within the divine provision concerning your very life, your daily needs. Be not afraid. You may be a law unto yourself, a law to your recovery from disease, a law to your business, a law of harmony to your welfare and your household and all things of your life, because God gave man dominion and you are entitled to it. In this very hour, you are entitled to be a law of recovery to your own self. That is the truth. Oh, thank you. We will go on, and in this very hour, have a wonderful service. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.